This patron saint of writers once said that the measure of love is to love without measure. We'll learn more about this extraordinary 16th century saint tonight, so please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer and welcome to uh, EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And our guest tonight is a professor of theology and he's the director of the Salesian Center for Faith and Culture at DeSales University. And he's here to help us learn more about the great doctor of the church, St. Francis DeSales. So please welcome Father Thomas Daly. Father Daly. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Here. Where is DeSales University? DeSales University is in the Diocese of Allentown, uh, just south of the city of Allentown, which is about midway between New York and Philadelphia. Okay, all right, great. And uh, how long have you been there? Well, counting my student days, uh, I went there as a student. Our seminary was there. Uh, I've been on the faculty now for 22 years. That's a good long time. It is. I guess you enjoy place, it. Great place to be. Oh, that's good. That's good. And one of the things I guess you teach is about St. Francis de Sales. I do. In fact, surprisingly enough, I've been teaching there 22 years. And this semester, for the first time ever, I'm teaching a course on the classic book that Francis de Sales wrote, The Introduction to the Devout Life. Okay. Yeah, that's a, a, it is his classic book. Mm -hmm. that, that's probably the book that's most often reprinted of all, all of his texts. He's, he's got a number of books that mm -hmm. are really wonderful, but that's the one that's most commonly printed. Definitely. That's the, that's the one that is um, recognized and has been uh, popular for 400 years now. Uh, yeah. as one of the best-selling devotional books ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, before we go into talking about that book, um, tell us a little bit about the life of St. Francis de Sales. Mm -hmm. Uh, we kn a lot of people know about the Salesians, right. which were founded by St. John Bosco. Right. And that's not your community. That's correct. Your community is called what? We are the Oblates of St. Francis de Sales, a much smaller congregation than the Salesians. Right. The Salesians, uh, as you mentioned, were, were founded by St. John Bosco. Um, but he was enamored of St. Francis de Sales, followed him right. shortly. Francis de Sales was born in 1567, lived till 1622. Um, was a bishop in, in southeastern France and the territory that's now Geneva. He's actually the Bishop of Geneva, although it's an interesting thing, he never lived in Geneva. Uh, the, the, the oh, scene, Geneva was not exactly friendly no. to Catholics at the time. No, it was the, a the, Calvinist city, correct? That, that's correct, but he was still the Bishop of Geneva. Um, and he, he was the first, oldest son of 13 children. He grew up in a, we'd probably refer to it as an aristocratic family, very well educated, went to the University of Paris, earned uh, two law degrees at the University of Padua, but um, followed the calling of God, whom he really believed uh, was calling him to a life in the church. Wasn't, didn't his father want him to be a lawyer? Very much so. His father, uh, as sort of the doting father of the firstborn son, had the son's life all planned out for him. Uh, he was going to be a diplomat he was going to have a political career. For that reason, he needed to get a law degree. Uh, and it, there, there's an interesting story. Francis de Sales, I, I think, because he confided in his mother about his vocation, finally got up the courage uh, when he came back from studying law at the University of Padua to tell his father that he was going to, to serve in the church. Uh, and his father, at first, was not happy. In fact, the story goes that his father locked himself. His, the father locked himself sort of in a room because he didn't want to say anything all day. And then finally, of course, gave his blessing. And, mm -hmm. and he became a priest and eventually the, the bishop. He became a priest and one of his first tasks uh, was 
uh, which he volunteered for, was to be a missionary to Geneva uh, and, and, and the area around the Lake of Geneva, a, a region called the Chablais. And he was, in effect, uh, attempting to convert the inhabitants back to Catholicism. Okay, how and did he do? He, by uh, one account, he converted 72,000 people back to, wow. back to the faith. And then, um, the then Bishop of Geneva made him the provost of the cathedral chapter, sort of the head of the local clergy, as it were. And um, he was named coadjutor bishop, and when uh, his predecessor died, he became the Bishop of Geneva. But still never got to go live there. Never lived in Geneva. In fact, had he been caught going through Geneva at the time, they, he would have been arrested and possibly executed. Right, right. Mm -hmm. it was, those were tough times. That yes, not indeed. much ecumenism going on in those uh, days. And not the way we talk about it now. No, no. Now, as a priest and bishop, uh, he had great concern for the souls. He just wasn't trying to rack up numbers of people he converted. Correct. He had real pastoral concern mm -hmm. for the state of the souls and the holiness of the souls that he converted in the rest of his uh, diocese. Uh, this is why he wrote. Is that not true? Yes, very much so. Um, at the time, of course, there were, there were political concerns and legal concerns. And, and in general, the townspeople and the folk who lived throughout the country would be whatever religion the leaders of the government told them to be because they didn't know any better. Um, it, was, it, was, it was the time where um, the catechism, which had just been uh, promoted from the Council of Trent, was, was just beginning to, to uh, catch on in the sense that folks weren't learning about the faith as much as they were simply being whatever they were told to be. And so Francis de Sales made a, made a very decided effort to educate people. Um, and uh, the reason why he's now a patron of Catholic writers and journalists is because when he went into a town, the town's name was Tonon, and the local, we'd call it a town council now, passed an ordinance that no one was allowed to go hear him preach. It was against the law. So the people didn't, they didn't go. So Francis de Sales had the idea that he would write down a summary of what he had intended to preach about and print it. The printing press had recently been invented. So he came up with what we would nowadays call pamphlets. And he would put them on the, the, the lamp posts in the town. He would slide them under people's doors, explaining in very clear terms what he was going to say and, and how, how logical it is and consistent it is. And, and how the faith makes sense. It's not just something you're told to believe. And eventually more and more people read this and, and, and were convinced of its reasonableness. And they came out to hear him preach and then pretty much the, the whole town came out. And the town council eventually allowed him to preach. They had to. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's pretty good. Um, are those pamphlets still available? They were actually collected and put into a book that is called the, um, it was given the title of the Catholic Controversy, which may not, which, which was not a title that he gave to them. But it's essentially laying out the doctrines of the faith in a very systematic point by point way um, and refuting what had been said about the Catholic faith erroneously. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of a, a, a debate going on on paper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that was his controversial writings, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the sense not that he was a controversy. Uh, by the way, that book, uh, The Catholic Controversy, is available still you know, still today. Yeah. And if anybody's interested in getting it, you can get it at uh, EWTN's Religious Catalog. That's at www.ewtnreligiouscatalog.com. And you can order that, or you can call them at 1-800-854-6316. Uh, we like to make St. Francis uh, de Sales available. And that would be a great way to, to learn the catechism today as well, because the, the doctrine of the faith has stayed the same. That's right. So it, it's still going to see the, the logic and beauty mm -hmm. of the faith that, that he po pointed out. Mm -hmm. Now... Let's talk a little bit about some of his spiritual writings. Sure. Uh, where would you like to start? 
Well, I, I would start where, where he started, and that was simply his writing, his writings of letters. People were constantly asking him questions about the faith and how best to live that out, and he would painstakingly write letters back to them. They didn't have email in those days, and they certainly didn't have text messaging. Um, but he produced thousands and thousands of letters on, on everyday subjects. Um, how do I get through the next day? Someone would write to him when my, when my uh, husband just passed away. Or my children are sick. How, do, how does that reflect the will of God? All kinds of simple, ordinary, everyday concerns. And he would write back and uh, explain how all of that was part of, in, in using the French term, the devout life or holiness, we'd say today. And, and his, his, his main distinguishing idea, which is a little bit difficult for us today because you know, we, 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 we've uh, appropriated the, the teaching of the Vatican Council about a universal call to holiness. Without using that term, that's what Francis de Sales was teaching 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, everything about our ordinary lives is where we be holy. Holiness is not something in addition to the rest of life. Uh, to, to give you an example, um, a, a young mother wrote to him and said, uh, Bishop, I'm trying very, very hard to, to live a good life, to be holy, but I can't get to church every day. I can't get to mass every day because I have these seven children who, to use 21st century language, are driving me crazy. Uh, they're, they're running all over the house. I and, couldn't imagine seven kids doing that. Right. <laughs> Francis de Sales wrote back to her, and again, putting yourself back 400 years ago, this is stunning. The bishop wrote back to her and said, Madam, you should not go to church every day. The bishop said this. He said, you become a saint by being the best mom you can be to those seven people God has put in your life. And that, that's the sort of practical genius that endeared him to so many people. And, and, and th this is the content of his letters. And there are, there are several volumes of his letters that, that, that remain available today in, 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 in English. And that, that's where I would start. Because it was from those letters that his deeper books emerged. Mm -hmm. Now, some, among those deeper books, you already mentioned The Devout Life. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. The introduction to the devout life is well, just that, an introduction to the devout life. And he, he, he wrote it, actually he, he was uh, cajoled into writing it by the spiritual director of one of these women from town um, who wrote to him for advice. She showed Francis de Sales's letters to this other priest in a visiting town when she was on a pilgrimage. And he said, these are, these are incredibly worthwhile. They should be published. In fact, he kind of wrote to Francis de Sales and said, if you don't publish them yourself, I'll do it. So Francis de Sales said, I'll, I'll take care of that. So he could edit them. And, and, and really, it, it, it's premised on the idea, as he explains in the very beginning, of what devotion, the better term in English would be holiness, really is. And he said, holiness is for everyone. It's not just for the monks and the nuns in the monasteries which of course were prevalent in Europe at the time. It's not just for the clergy. It's for the, 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 the mother. It's for the bricklayer. It's for the merchant in town. And everyone lives their holiness differently based on their state in life. And the rest of the book explains how, or really introduces the, the ordinary person to a holy way of life. Mm -hmm. Francis de Sales' spirituality is eminently for the laity um, and, and eminently practical. Yeah, and he was concerned about the soldier, the, mm -hmm. the merchant, mm -hmm. the housewife, right. you know, all these folks uh, who had different concerns than the clergy. And he, one of the great lines is that you, they should not have the spirituality of a bishop. Right. Uh, nor a bishop of them. Exactly. Uh, that you have to have a, a spirituality appropriate to your way of life. Exactly. His starting, his starting point was your vocation or your state in life. Whatever that is, that's where you be holy. 
Because otherwise, holiness is something extraneous to the vast majority of where we spend our time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's in addition to everyday life. And Francis de Sales' idea was, no, it's, it's in and through the everyday that you, get, that, that you practice holiness. Mm -hmm. To give an example from the book, he speaks about virtues and, and he emphasizes what he calls the little virtues. Um, now that, that's a bad marketing term for Francis de Sales. Um, but he says, he says, look, he says, everyone wants to practice, would, would love to practice the big ones. Everyone would love to be courageous and save someone from a burning house or be magnanimous in, in, in their generosity. He says, all well and good. He said, the problem is most of us will never have a chance to do that. What I encourage you to do, because everybody can do it, no matter what your, your job, your, your way of life is, is to practice the little virtues like being humble or being gentle or being simple. Anyone can do those. Um, everyone can do those. And they are as virtuous as the big showy virtues. Now, I said it's a, bad, it's, it's a bad marketing term for them because we, we hear the word little virtues and we think, oh, they're just little things. Until you start trying to be gentle with everyone. As I, as I often say to folks, try that on the highway. <laughs> um, there you go. Or to, or to be humble about things, or to, or to be simple. Um, how, how, can we, how can we be, be just, to use an expression of his, just be who we are and be that perfectly well for the love of God who made us who we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, no, these are... Uh, uh, important things, and this is the, uh, the, another book that we have, a religious catalog, that would be well worth having people pick up to, in order mm -hmm. to read, uh, now how do I get to be holy in my way of life? You know, I've got laundry to do. Mm -hmm. You know, how can I be holy mm -hmm. while I'm trying to do the laundry and the kids are just sure. going outside to make more dirty clothes. Sure. So what do I, what do, I do sure. and how do I find patience exactly. in that situation? Exactly. I mean, there are chapters in there on, on how, how we should speak, um, how we should dress. Uh, and and, and, and there, there's some humor in that, in, in what he says in there. He's speaking about um, um, our, our appearance and how we dress. And, and keep in mind, he's writing to... to folks in the court, the princes and the princesses. And he said, you, you know, he said, remember, he said, old people should never try to dress fancy. They, it, it's just folly. They look ridiculous. He says, leave that, leave that folly to the young. You know, and, and, and he's talking about the, the person of a more advanced age who's trying to still look like she's 16. He says, we, so we all they know had that still. same problem they back the then. Same. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Which is why Francis de Sales' of spirituality is so, so timeless and, and, and still perfect for today. We were speaking in class the other day about games. Um, you know, again, games at the court were part of the courtly life. And, and Francis de Sales, he said, you know, some games are okay, some you probably shouldn't waste your time with. He said, but the real principle is everybody needs leisure. Everybody needs to take a break once in a while. Um, and that's a good thing. Sometimes, sometimes we, we, we get into the thinking that I, I have to work all the time or, or I have to work at being holy all of the time. When in fact, even in leisurely pursuits, we can be holy. So as I'm teaching this to, to, to the 20 year olds in my class, I'm trying to show them pictures of the ancient games he was talking about, ancient versions of croquet and chess. Then I flashed up on the screen the big picture of March Madness. I said, what about that? They all thought it was perfectly fine. I said, it is. I said, but here's, here's the principle of Francis de Sales. Anything, game, recreation, sport, is good if it helps us. But if it takes all our attention and all our affection, he says, that can be a problem. Then, then you can produce the, the statistics in March about how productivity in most businesses in the country goes down because everybody's watching the game. That's the kind of absorption that, that he would say, that's probably not a good thing. Right. So it's that, it's that sort of, um, 
uh, as one as Elizabeth Stop, a, 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 an English uh, biographer and, and writer about Francis de Sales, she called it inspired common sense. That's what he gives us, inspired common sense. It's everyday ordinary matters elevated to a life of holiness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, you know, it, it's not common to think of holiness and our recreation. You know, that, mm -hmm. that's, that's usually uh, we're, we're taking a break when we, uh, from everything, mm -hmm. and we think we, we can think of ourselves taking a break from holiness if we exactly. were not careful. Exactly. But he says, no, that, that's, that's not it. That, you, that holiness belongs everywhere, including in our leisure. One, one, of, the, one of the great um, teachings of Francis de Sales, and, and he actually incorporated it in a little book that he wrote for the, the Sisters of the Visitation of Holy Mary, um, the, the order that he founded with St. Jane de Chantal. And it's called The Direction of Intention. He says, if at the beginning of anything we do, if we can be conscious of directing whatever it is we do, to the love of God. If, if we can consciously say, I'm doing this for the love of God, then I have just made holy whatever it is I'm doing. It could be baking, it could be driving, it could be playing basketball. It's now something I've given to God. He said, that's how the vast majority of people become holy. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. well, that sounds good. One of the other things that is also important about him is he had an important relationship with uh, St. Jane Francis Chantal. Right. Tell us a little bit about that relationship. St. Jane and Francis de Sales um, founded the religious order known as the Visitation of Holy Mary. But to back that up, uh, Jane was a widow in the town of Dijon, her, Famous for the mustard. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Her brother was the, arch, was the bishop of Dijon. And it was tradition back then that during Lent, you would invite bishops from neighboring towns to come in and preach the Lenten sermons. So Francis de Sales was invited to Dijon. Sitting in front of him is Jane de Chantal. And both of them had this uncanny sense we'd call it an inspiration, that they were to meet, that they were to do something incredible for God. Um, Francis de Sales became her spiritual director uh, through long uh, years of, of correspondence and conversation and discerning the will of God. Francis de Sales began this new religious order, um, St. Jane being the first of, of the sisters. And what was new about it at the time was that they weren't necessarily going to take the traditional vows of chastity and poverty and obedience. They were going to vow to love because if you love, everything else is included. More distinctly, they were not going, part of what they would do would be to love others, which meant they would leave the monastery once in a while and go into town and care for the sick or the poor, um, not in a, in, in a hospital sense, but, but simply in a visiting sense, hence the, the visitation. Um, it, it was the first religious order of, of its kind to do that. Prior, prior to that, there were always enclosed monasteries. Um, so that was the novelty of what they started. And again, it goes back to that key Salesian principle that doing ordinary things extraordinarily well is what we'll be about. Mm -hmm. The second distinction uh, of the order is that it would accept into the monastery women who, quite frankly, would not be able to survive in other monasteries. Uh, they were elderly, they were widows, they were infirm. Um, because again, Francis de Sales believed and taught that holiness was for everyone not just, not just those who had the strength to endure a vigorous religious life. Uh, to this day, uh, I'm told the, the visitation order is the only enclosed religious order in the world that has as part of its rule that women can go and spend uh, uh, weeks at a time 
inside the monastery with the sisters. Because again, it, it, it's, it, it's continuing that tradition of welcoming in anyone and, and, and living the ordinary life extraordinarily well. Mm -hmm. So, the, and the Visitation Sisters are still around today? Yes, they are. Uh, they're here in Mobile, in fact. Um, I, I, that would be the closest monastery, I believe. Mobile, um, Alabama. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, Georgetown in, in, in Washington, D.C., in Massachusetts, there are St. Louis, um, New York. They're, they're throughout the United States. They're throughout the world still, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was also someone who assisted in the founding of an order, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as well as running a diocese mm -hmm. and evangelizing in that diocese to bring, uh, to restore unity in the church, uh, plus giving spiritual direction to people and writing books to, to help with the spiritual life. Sounds like he was pretty busy. It's probably why he was so skinny. He, he never slowed down. Um, and... Um, in fact, uh, many folks tried to get him to slow down, but he, 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 he believed that this was all the Lord's will for him, and he, and he kept going as long as he could. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and add to that was that the, the princes and the kings were also calling upon him to do diplomatic work. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so this is, you know, in one sense, he's the, the kind of saint that the modern world uh, can re- in, discover mm -hmm. uh, and make application to our own situation. Uh, like you said, in the Vatican Council, you know, the, the call to holiness was said to be a universal call to holiness. And his theology fits that very well. Fits it perfectly. Uh, nowadays, we, we would talk about the merger of faith and culture, uh, the, the, the concept of culture so heavily promoted by Pope John Paul I, uh, second. And, and that was his idea, H how to bring the, the beautiful truths of our faith into engagement with the culture of wherever you live and whatever you do. That's exactly what Francis de Sales was about. That's, that's why we, we, we've created a center for faith and culture that tries to continue this in the 21st century. Good, so, so then you run that. Yes. Well, that's good, do you get a lot of students involved in it? We do, we have students, we have, uh, a, a two-year leadership program for students that's unique in the country um, that we have students going through every year. We have, we have uh, what we call the Faith and Reason Honors Program, an academic honors program mm -hmm. that is run through the center. Uh, lots of lectures and, and, and programs and panel discussions and, and all, the, all seeking to bring, again, the beauty of what we believe to the, to the issues of modern life. Okay, great. Well, we have to take a break, but we're going to be back in a couple of minutes. We'd like to get your questions and your comments on this great St. Francis de Sales. So please stay with us. Welcome back. We have a really nice uh, audience here with us today, and they're from different parts of the country. Uh, and they've come here on pilgrimage, and we'd love to invite you to come here and join us on pilgrimage. If you can be with us, uh, please contact our pilgrimage department at 205 271 2966. That's 205 271 2966. 
or go to our website, www.ewtn.com. And with, they'll give you all kinds of information about where you can stay, the scheduling of the masses, uh, the most important thing, uh, scheduling of the programs and tours of the network and directions on how to get up to Hansville to see the sisters. So we'd love to have you uh, come here and visit us. It makes it a lot more fun for me, too. So, uh, you ready for some questions? I think so. All right, let's start off with a call. We have Nicholas on the line. Hello, Nicholas. Yes, hello, Father. Hi. Um, good evening where, to both fathers. Where um, are you from? My question is, did St. Francis de Sales have a temp temperamental nature? Uh, I was told that once, and I wanted to know if that was true or not. And also, did he speak to that issue at all in any of his writings? Because... We all are a little temperamental at times, I think. What do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, no. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. In fact, it's Thank a, God it, I'm not defensive. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's a great question, and uh, you're, you're very correct. Um, temperamental might actually be putting it nicely. Uh, Francis de Sales admitted himself that he, uh, he had a hot streak to him. In fact... Many of, of those who were with him uh, often wondered how come he did not get angry in, in situations where someone was ridiculing him or, or mocking him or calling out against him. You, it was almost expected that you would, you would get angry. And his famous response was, would you, would you wish for me to lose in 15 minutes what I've spent my whole life trying to control? So he knows that that hot streak is in him, but he also knows that it's, it, it's not the best way to deal with folks. And so we were, he worked very hard at it. He, there, there's a chapter in the introdu introduction to the devout life about anger. And, and, and if you also know his life story, it, it, it's his own chapter. Um, so yes, he, 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 he had that potential in him, but he worked very diligently to counteract that by being gentle. All right. We have a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from New Mexico. New Mexico. Good to have you here. And what's your question? Well, it's not about the topic, but my question is, why don't we as the church consider when Jesus comes down to earth a second time to get his mother for her assumption, the second coming? So when, when Jesus came for the assumption of Mary into heaven. Why isn't that the second coming? Do you want to take that? <laughs> I'll try to answer that one. Um, Francis de Sales actually uh, wrote often about the assumption. I'm not sure he ever, he ever dealt with that question, but um, <laughs> I, I, I think the, the, the imagery certainly of the assumption is not so much Jesus coming down to get his mother as, as his mother being raised to heaven. Um, so it, it, it's not the geographical idea of Jesus changing places as much as it is his mother changing places. Right, so he didn't come he down, didn't come. she right. went up. Right. That, that, would be, that would be my answer. That, mm -hmm. that sounds like a good answer. And also, it's very important that, you know, he didn't come to judge the world mm -hmm at that time, mm -hmm. whereas at the second coming, he'll be coming to judge the world right. and, um, and straighten everybody out. His mother, he didn't have to straighten out. True. <laughs> All right, we have a caller, Joe. Hello, Joe. Hi, how you doing? Fine, where are you from? I'm from Staten Island, New York. Great, we got a couple here from Staten Island. It's good to oh, have great. you with us. So what's, uh, what's your question? Uh, I was wondering, uh, Francis, De Chantal, uh, Francis de Sales and Jane de Chantal, who they based their sainthood on, and uh, if there was anybody, and who their favorite saints were. Who their favorite saints were, wow. Uh, that would be tough to narrow down. If, if you look through the writings of Francis de Sales, uh, he names countless numbers of saints as, as examples of what he's teaching. Francis de Sales, um, was named for St. Francis of Assisi. Um, his, his own um, favorite saints, I'm, I'm not sure that there would be one, at one in particular. Um, but the saintly life 
was certainly something that he was trying to, to, to teach about. I don't think we modern people have as much appreciation of how many saints mm -hmm. seem to impact the lives of people in the 16th and 17th century. That people, there were, you know, we don't have as many saints days as they did. Every day had its own saint, and they would be very devoted for the saint of the day. Sure. That was and, a and, very and also, they're, they're living in that part of the world where those saints came from. Right, and 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 so there's there's an there's an almost natural linkage with, for the folks in Spain, for all the saints from from Spain, and and then the number of them as an example. So he, as I say, he he does reference a lot of different saints in his writings, but I don't know that there's any one in particular that you would call his his favorite. Okay, all right, thank you. I have another question from our studio audience, sir. Where are you from? I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. Good to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. And what's your question? My question is, St. Francis de Sales, he writes a lot about living out your daily vocation and, and your station in life and to live it well. How did he incorporate the Beatitudes into that teaching? Well, it's out, out of the Beatitudes of mm -hmm. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 mm -hmm. fit into uh, the spirituality of St. Francis de Sales. Very easily, uh, and, and very much so, in, in the sense that, that he wrote, you'll find when you read his writings that, that the, the sacred scriptures are woven through it, uh, almost as if they were his own language. And certainly he appeals to the Beatitudes and the, the blessedness, that, that's what he's aiming for, that's, that's what the devout life is. Um, to be meek, to be humble of heart, to be peaceable. Uh, all of those beatitudes are in fact what, in essence, what he's talking about. What he's doing is, is taking those ideas, uh, th those very valuable ways of being, and, and, and trying to say that you be that, you, you have that attitude of being in being a tradesman or being a soldier or being a parent or in, in whatever state of life that is. So, so what he was really doing was, meek, was merging the two. Yeah, blessed mm -hmm. are the meek would apply to a soldier as much as to a bishop or a housewife. Very much. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and he would try to bring that in. Mm -hmm. We have another Joe on the line. Hello, Joe. Uh, hello, Father. How are you? Fine. Where are you from? Um, I'm from Pennsylvania, about an hour south of DeSales. Oh, great. Good to have you. And what is your question? Uh, my question is about St. Francis de Sales as the patron saint of deaf people. Mm -hmm. um, there doesn't seem to be a lot written about that, but, but I know he's declared the patron of the deaf. And I was wondering if uh, Father Bailey could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, tell us about I, that. That's I, interesting. I could, but I have to confess I can't talk about it with sign language. I, 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 I right, don't know right, that. Right, right, right. Um, but where that came from, in, in fact, Francis de Sales is uh, one of the patron saints of the deaf, and where that came from goes back to what we were talking about earlier and, and, and Francis de Sales' concern to educate the faithful. He had on his, on his staff, when he was a bishop, uh, one of the folks working there who was hard of hearing uh, and, and could, could barely hear. But Francis de Sales says to himself, uh, if holiness is for everyone, then it, it includes him too. And so I've got to figure out a way to communicate this, the catechism and, and, and prayers and, and educate this young man who can't hear. So Francis de Sales created kind of his own sign language, his own rudimentary form of communicating with someone who, who couldn't hear his words. Um, and for that reason, um, among others, was, was named patron saint of the deaf. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, now, it was, so it wasn't just the Trappist who had come up with a sign language. Mm -hmm. He also came up mm -hmm. with a sign language. I, I don't know what it was. I'm not sure anyone knows what it was. But, but the, 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 the key part to the story is he wanted to communicate how to pray and, and the, the elements of the catechism to even this person who worked for him. And he figured out a way to go out to the servant. And, and, and that's the methodology of Francis de Sales. Um, 
That, that's the idea of merging faith and culture. That's the idea of, of a universal call to holiness. I'll take this great gift of our faith and our spirituality and our, our beliefs and get it to you however I have to do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, good. We have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? New Mexico. New Mexico. So you're related to that other young man that was here. <laughs> What's your question? Why, do, why don't some priests wear their um, priestly garments out in public? So why don't some priests wear their priestly uh, garb when they're in public? So, Father? Well, um, it doesn't apply to you. No, I'm, I'm dressed tonight. Uh, that's a very broad question, of course. Um, I, I'm thinking, as you asked that, I'm thinking of, of, of a priest who used to be the pastor of one of our parishes who himself was, was a builder, a construction man. And he was known in the neighborhood for being very, very good at it. Well, when he's working with concrete all day, he, he didn't have his priestly garb sure, on. Sure. When he came in for mass, of course, he put his cassock on. Um, so part of the answer to your question is that there may be a reason why, um, a situation. Um, but in general, I, uh, there isn't necessarily an answer for that. Francis de Sales uh, would make the point that, while of course it is important to, to dress as who we are, um, he writes in the introduction to The Devout Life that, that he doesn't agree with, with those thinkers who say you change a person or you, you, you convert a person or you grow starting from the outside. Um, it's not the clothes that make you who you are in this example, but you start with a person's heart mm -hmm. and in a sense change from the inside. Mm -hmm. So he, he was not uh, a big fan of external feats of, of courage and holiness. But, but make your heart humble and gentle and the outside will, will, will follow. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they go together in an, in, in an integrated life. Um, but that's a, that's a long way of saying, I'm not really sure how to answer your question. Yeah, I, I think sometimes uh, some priests want to identify with people in the world mm -hmm. as a way to, to be on their level and communicate with them. And, you know, that, that I think that that would be uh, a noble motive. But the other side of that, I, I find, is uh, I travel a lot. I'm in airports. People would know I was a priest if I wasn't wearing a Roman collar. Mm -hmm. And people will stop me, you know. And, and that's one of the reasons why I wear the clerics mm -hmm. is so that, you know, for instance, I was just in the airport in Atlanta on uh, Sunday coming back home from a, some lectures. And a young soldier wanted his rosary blessed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I wasn't wearing clerics, he would never stop sure. to get his rosary blessed. Sure. But he wanted it blessed, and I was able to be there for him and, mm -hmm. and do that. So Absolutely. that's... that's Definitely uh, a benefit. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that overall, the benefits of wearing our clerics far outweigh those of not wearing them. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so that's a, a good thing. We have another caller. We have Tom on the line. Hello, Tom. Hello, Father Mitch. Yeah, where are you from, Tom? I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Great city. And what is your question? Well, Father Mitch, I remember you from the John Anken Ankenberg show in the 1970s oh. when you were a young priest. Right. So I'm glad to see you hale and hearty. And I'm also a graduate of DeSales Catholic High School in Lockport, New York, mm -hmm. in 1962. And remember so many seminarians from Niagara University, from from the um, OSFS uh, congregation there. It's your congregation. And they ran so many high schools in Philadelphia, I think mm -hmm. Roman Catholic High School there. And my question is, and I was, uh, I was a class behind Father David Whalen, who was one of your provincials recently, mm -hmm. and a good friend of mine. I wonder what the Oblates of St. Francis de Sales are doing in the 21st century to recapture the wonderful, wonderful charisma they had in the 1960s in cities like Philadelphia and Lockport and cities in Ohio. Are they still running high schools? What is the focus of the Oblates of St. Francis de Sales? All right. Thank you, Tom. 
It's a good question. You, you've, you've rattled off the names and places that are certainly familiar to me. Um, the, the, the charism of the Oblates of St. Francis de Sales, our purpose as a religious order, is not um, linked to a specific activity, such as teaching or preaching, um, but it's really to carry forth the, the, the spirit of St. Francis de Sales in whatever we do, which again is keeping with that Salesian spirituality. Uh, certainly, m many Oblates had been involved in education, uh, particularly secondary school or high school education. We still are. Um, probably about half of our province, um, a little less than half now, still does that work. But we also try to follow the call of the church to go where we're needed. So, for example, a, a, a lot of Oblates are, are pastors of parishes in North Carolina where they simply don't have the clergy to staff the parishes. Oblates are, are military chaplains and hospital chaplains. And again, it, it goes back to that, that foundational idea of Francis de Sales, that holiness is for all of these different activities. So our work as a congregation, while it, it, it was you know, numerically obvious and numerically um, uh, large and concentrated in schools, Northeast Catholic High School, the school in Philadelphia, was at one time the largest secondary school in the world. Uh, we had 100, 110 priests, I think, in the school, in wow. a high school. Um, That's huge. That school recently was closed because there aren't the students anymore. So as times are changing and, 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 and people are moving, um, our goal is to, our hope is to be able to move with them and still bring that, that wisdom and spirit of Francis de Sales wherever they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that you know, you've spoken about is the way that um, you know, the Francis de Sales spirituality is oriented towards people of all sorts of different lifestyles. Mm -hmm. Does he have much that deals specifically with family life? You know, I know that he has spirituality for the housewife and the husband and such, mm -hmm. but is there much on family life? Well, not so much in, in the way we're speaking about it today and, okay. and what we're looking for. Because again, it, his writings grew out of responses to questions. So he's responding to the housewife or he's responding to the the military man who has left his family at home. Um, and, and certainly he writes about the relationship between spouses and the relationship between children and parents. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't, he, he doesn't address the family as a whole in the sense of the way we speak about family life today. Yeah, probably because they didn't have the same it, problems yeah, that we have. Different time, different place. Right, mm -hmm. right. We have another call. We have John on the line. Hello, John. Hi. Hi. Where are you from? Parma, Ohio. Great. And what's your question? Uh, it's about him being a uh, patron of writers. Uh, is there a written form letter that St. Francis or somebody wrote to uh, get his intercession? And I was wondering uh, what were the qualities he had to be named that particular pa patron? Let's start off with that. First of all, okay. what were the qualities of St. Francis uh, of de Sales who, uh, that, that would make him the patron saint of writers? Well, in, in the papal decree naming him the patron of writers, um, what was mentioned was his ability to convey religious truth in a way that ordinary folks would understand. It was his inventiveness and uh, initiative in communicating the word, that story about his using pamphlets when he wasn't mm -hmm. allowed to preach. It was his, his emphasis on educating people in the faith, from teaching the catechism to his deaf servant, to uh, beginning schools and, and sodalities and, and other CCD, we would refer to it uh, nowadays, in his diocese. So all of these things, um, and, and quite frankly, simply the, the beauty of his writing. Uh, I'm, I'm told that Francis de Sales' written works 
are to this day studied in, in classes of French literature, not for their religious content, but for the, the style with which he wrote. So he's a really good writer saying really important things in a way that people can understand and that communicates our faith. Um, all of those things add up to his being a patron saint of Catholic writers. And then the other part of his question? Is, is there a standard form for Francis de Sales interceding? Um, not that I know of. There are, there are novenas of Francis de Sales. There is a method for Francis, that Francis de Sales had for praying the rosary. There are, there are various devotional uh, prayers connected with Francis de Sales. Um, most of which we have published on the, on the website at the, at the university. So what's the website of the university? Well, the, it's www.desales, D-E-S-A-L-E-S dot E-D-U. And then... So desales is D-E-S-A-L-E-S -E 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 dot E-D-U. And then go to the link for the Salesian Center and you'll find our library. And I want to give the address for the Salesian Center for Faith and Culture. Uh, that's what is, that's your, what your institute is called, the Salesian Center for Faith and Culture, DeSales University. And it's at 2755 Station Avenue, 2755 Station Avenue, Center Valley, Pennsylvania. And the uh, zip code is 18034. There's also a phone number you can call, 610-282. 1100 610-282-1100, uh, or the, again, the website. Mm -hmm. And the website sounds like it'd be pretty interesting to, to have uh, novenas to St. Francis de Sales. If somebody out there wants to be a writer, mm -hmm. they could uh, pray a uh, novena to St. Francis de Sales for that gift. Right. One of the things that, that we're trying to do with, with the website and the Salesian Center is, is to be a place where folks can go to learn more about Francis de Sales. So we have a, we have a very large electronic library where are these, these documents and devotions and articles and, and primary writings about Francis de Sales, um, all of that can be found online. Are his writings online as well? Several of them are, or link, we, we have links to where they are, or we have links to the stores where you can, you, uh, resource centers where you, where you can get them. Um, okay. Most of those that have been translated into English are available. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you have some of the French originals available? We have a, a couple up there, but I'm not sure how many folks from France are visiting our website, so we, okay. didn't, we didn't work real hard at that part. Right. Uh, that might be something to work on, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially since it's such classical form. You know, the, I, I find that interesting that St. Francis uh, de Sales wrote in very beautiful French, and so much so that it's still considered classic mm -hmm. uh, style. I, I think that this is a, another important element of the ministry, that learning how to write mm -hmm. and how to use language correctly mm -hmm. right. is a way to learn how to think more clearly Definitely. and put it out there more clearly. Francis de Sales, actually, he had a very good friend named uh, Antoine Favre, who was the president of the Senate at the time. Together they founded an academy, but those two would actually write to each other in Latin, and they would almost play a game to see who could, who could write the reply in a, in, a, in a nicer or fancier Latin. Bec they believed in language. In fact, Favre's son was one of the founding members of the French Academy. So language which, was which always is, important. And the French Academy is what? Is, is the, the guardian of the French language and the French culture even today. Right. Um, and, and, and academic um, limited number of seats for folks around the world, uh, very prestigious um, guardian of language and culture. But, but it's certainly through language uh, that, that, that the faith gets communicated. It, 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 it's a faith of the word, the, the word made flesh. So, so that language becomes very important, um, whether in spoken form or in written form. One of Francis de Sales' great works um, is his, his letter, 99-page letter, but it's a letter about preaching and, and, and how to preach. Great for, for, for priests and the clergy to, to, to learn from. Mm -hmm. uh, again, all about the importance of that word and, and how, how critical that is to our faith. All right. Well, thank you. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time. 
Uh, thank you very much for being with us. You're most welcome. And informing us about St. Francis. And I'd like you to join me in giving a blessing to our audience. Be happy to. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May He lead you in all of your ways by His peace. May God bless you, the Father, the Son, the Son Amen. and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And you know, um, we can bring you Father Daly to talk about one of the great saints of the church and all the other guests who come here because this network is brought to you by you. You make it possible with your donations to EWTN. Uh, without your help, we, can't not, we cannot exist. It just won't happen. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of our bills. God bless you, and thank you very much.